I heard the, the thunder rumbling, and I look at Sam Trayer and her mom, and I'm like, please pray that it starts raining, because I'm supposed to do yard work this afternoon. <laughs> so it's so awesome that their prayers were heard today. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, it's good to see you all here uh, uh, this morning as, as we dive into this reading from the from the chap from the eleventh chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to say about uh, the story this week, I uh, was brought back to the first time ever in my life that I was asked to pray for someone. Um, and kind of in that your professional prayer kind of situation, right? Um, and it was way before I started seminary. I was just a public school teacher, and, and Karen and I uh, would go to this, this music festival, and we got to know this young man named Michael at one of these music festivals. Um, uh, this guy named Mike Mary, one of our high school uh, classmates named Terry. We had a, a group, kind of youth group outing um, on, a, on a lake in central Illinois. And he had asked, this, this, this guy named Michael had asked uh, our youth director if he would baptize him in the lake. And the youth director was like, yeah, I will absolutely do that. And then Michael looked at me and he said, and Dan, after Marty baptizes me, um, will you pray for me? And I was scared. I was like, well, at first I said yes. And then I was like, oh, I just said yes. i got to figure out how to pray and pray publicly uh, really for the first time. Now, this conversation happened at like 8 a.m. in the morning, and the baptism was going to happen at about 4 o'clock. We are going to have a cookout after. So we walk into the lake, and Marty does the dunking thing, right? And he baptizes Michael in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I said, well, let us pray. And I said, dear God. And then it was quiet for like 45 seconds. <laughs> because I had no idea what to say. I mean, it's a lot of pressure, right, to pray for someone. You want to make sure that you say the right words and that they have deep, profounding theological meaning. You want to make sure that your prayers are heard by this God who's got much more important things on God's mind than maybe the prayer that I said. So, Sitting at 45 seconds, all these thoughts were running through my head. And then finally, words came out of my mouth. And they were, thank you, God. This was pretty freaking awesome. Amen. That was my prayer. <laughs> then we went, and we had hot dogs by the lake. And Michael came up to me, and he said, Dan, you know what? That was the absolute best prayer I've ever heard in my life. It's like, are you kidding me? Right? Like, I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. And I have never had the opportunity to ask Michael why that prayer was the best prayer that he had ever heard. But I've had the opportunity, uh, because of my station in life, to pray with a lot of people. And pray with a lot of people during really, really good times and really, really ugly times. And I need to say to you that any time that I've asked to pray with someone, I still get nervous. All right? And it's the nerves aren't about um, the act of speaking out loud. The Lord knows I speak a lot. Right? But it's about saying the right words and doing the right things. Right? Which makes this week's Bible lesson so interesting. And not only interesting to me, but interesting to those people who have come up to me and said, Dan, I want you to teach me how to pray. I have no idea what to do or what to say, if I need to be quiet or loud, or if I need to have a special time, or if I pray, can pray, whatever. Like, just teach me how to pray. And this is the same sort of discussion that this unnamed disciple has with Jesus here, right? This disciple going up to Jesus and saying, essentially, teach us how to pray. Now, 
Now, this disciple has witnessed Jesus going off at separate times um, throughout the Gospel of Luke, going into quiet, secluded places or places by himself to pray and communion with God. And when this disciple asks Jesus, teach me to how to pray, I think it could be that this disciple really wants to know what it is like to be in communion with God. Right? I want to learn from you what it's like to have this relationship that you have with God, this thing that I admire. I want you to tell me about how God is stirring in your heart. And, and Jesus goes on and he, and he prays essentially a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer. That, uh, a shorter version of the Lord's Prayer, uh, shorter than the one we say in Sunday worship. But if you can get beyond the actual words Jesus uses, what Jesus does, he says a prayer about his theology, about who God is, and about how God is active in the world. Jesus, when Jesus prays, he asserts that God listens, that God loves, that God forgives, that God sustains us, and that God asks us to be good people to want another. That's a pretty good operating theology from the Son of God, right? That the God that Jesus prays to is a God who always listens. Now, it's important to note that this, this listening, this, this listening that God does isn't like God the Holy Vending Machine, which is why it's so funny that it's raining this morning, right? That when we pray to God, it's not this prescriptive prayer saying, God, I want you to do this for me. And if you don't do this exact thing, um, I know that you're not listening to me. Right? That's really making ourselves God and not allowing God to be the God who God is. Right? Instead, we have a God who promises to be there for us, to listen to our supplications. And this listening is not necessarily to grant us the things that we ask for, rather to indicate to us that we have a God who wants to be in a continual relationship with us. And part of being in a healthy, productive relationship with someone is listening to the other person. So we have a God who wants to be in a relationship with us, who listens to us. And this God listens to us because this God loves us. Because you all know that there's people in this world, we're supposed to love everyone, but there's people who we love but are really hard to like. Do we spend a lot of time listening to those people that we don't like? No. But God always listens to us out of love. And then Jesus talks about how this God who listens and loves forgives us of those things that, that burden us, that encumber us in our daily life, in this life of freedom that God wants to give us. Right? That God says, it's okay that you mess up. I'm never going to stop listening to you or loving you. I forgive you. Maybe God should tell us every once in a while that we should forgive ourselves as well. Right? So this God who loves, who listens, and forgives also sustains us, provides us with our needs. And that's part of this, this next section that Jesus talks about with this disciple, right? This persistent praying, right? Uh, and this pray for what you want and what you get, and all this kind of stuff. If you're Kid asks for a fish, don't give him a snake, which is a very weird thing. I don't know if I would have, maybe would have chosen a different animal there, but I'm not going to judge Jesus on that. Um, but this idea that, that even though we pray to God, to, to God for the things that we might want, we might desire, God's going to answer and give us the thing that's going to sustain us. Right? And sustaining somebody is a lot different than giving them the thing that they want. Right? And if you need an example of that, you should have been at our house for dinner last night when we made vegetables 
for Tucker to eat. He did not want to eat them, but we made them so he, we, he could be sustained. Right? So God loves, God listens, God forgives, God sustains, and then God calls us to a holy life where we live for other now, this holy life that we live for other people is, is, is in, in, ingrained in the way that I pray. Right? One of my seminary professors, when he talked about the creed, he said if you, uh, if you say, if you use the word, you got to go out and do the thing that you say you're going to do. Right? And the same works for prayer for me. If I pray for someone to have peace of mind, that prayer is me opening myself up to God, saying, allow me, God, use me to bring that person peace of mind. There's a Christian author and, and, and public theologian that I admire a great deal. His name is Shane Claiborne. And he kind of lives in this community that is all about living for one another. He takes, uh, he takes uh, weapons and turns them into garden tools um, to get, get weapons off the streets, all this kind of stuff. And, and one of his favorite quotes um, that speaks to me is that, uh, it goes something like this. When, when I asked God to move mountains, God gave me a shovel. And that's prayer. So as I pray for people to, to overcome sickness or, or feel more filled with life, I'm asking God to use me to answer my own prayers. So as Jesus talks to this disciple about what prayer is, he, he, he claims this theology, right? This theology of love and and, and um, forgiveness, this theology of a listening God who sustains us, but he also declares a theology of being in service and in, in communion with one another. You see that, that response that we have when people tell us difficult things and, and we say, we're going to pray for you, that has momentous impacts. That has value. That has worth. Now, much like some of you, at times when I say that to others, when I'm going to hold you in prayer or ask how I can help them, and they simply say, just pray for me. You're already doing it by praying for me. Like, really? That's all you want me to do? Maybe we should be so quick to not think that prayer can be enough. As long as we abide by this prayer theology that Jesus presents. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I think about Michael every once and again. I think about that experience of the baptism in the lake. I think about that experience of praying Think about his words saying, that was the best prayer I ever heard. And when I think about that, even though questions reside, I get this sense of feeling of, of joy and happiness. Because prayer is ultimately about that connection with God, that relationship with God. It's not about the words we say or where we do it or if we're super pious or super earthy. It's about the fact that we're opening ourselves up to the experience of sharing ourselves with the God who wants nothing more than for us to share our lives with God. So let us be a people who, who continue to develop our practice of prayer. Let us be people who take our prayer lives seriously. Let us not be uh, too willing to think that our prayers don't matter, because they absolutely do. I thank you for being the 
prayer for those people that you are, and know that I pray for all of you every day.